All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Murphy, who is coming to us live uh, from a land down under where it's reasonably early in the morning. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, testing fundamental physics uh, with solar twin stars. Uh, he uh, has a long and noble history measuring fundamental physics, uh, having uh, frequently measured the, uh, uh, the fine structure constant uh, with quasar sightlines. Um, and of course, he is the uh, PhD, he was the PhD supervisor of our very own Eliza Barrera, uh, who left us last year. So thank you very much for, for coming uh, all this way and waking up so early in the morning. And please uh, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come and uh, give a talk. I, I've, I've unfortunately never been to UC Riverside. I've been to a few other UC campuses, uh, but I uh, heard good things about that from obviously George, but also Elisa, who was, um, who, who, as I understand it, uh, really enjoyed her time there. But I have to catch up with her and get all the, the dirt, so to speak. Um, so yes, I will be talking to you about um, stars. As, as you just heard, my expertise in history has really been in quasar absorption line studies. Um, so why am I talking about stars? Well, it's because they just happen to be another really good probe. We think of um, the fundamental constants um, so that we can test whether those constants really are constant. So the, some of the work that I'll be talking about today are, are, is by the people you see on your screen. Uh, Fan Liu, who's a new postdoc with me, and two PhD students, Daniel Berkey, who's really um, done all the hard work behind the new solar twin method, and Christian Lehman, who's, who's joined us to try and find distant solar twins. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully name drop them throughout the talk. Um, let me see here. Okay. All right, so uh, what would I like to talk about? Well, I'll, I'll talk about, first of all, if for, some, for people who've never heard me uh, talk about this topic, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of discuss why we might think that it's a good thing to test whether the constants, these things called constants, actually vary. Um, it sounds like a nonsensical thing to do um, initially, but uh, you soon realize that actually this is an extremely important thing to do for fundamental physics. Um, and the sort of questions we can answer astrophysically with these techniques um, are whether or not the constants are the same near or in other galaxies in the distant universe, and whether they've changed over the intervening time between us and those galaxies and in intervening space, um, whether or not our constants, the constants of nature vary across our galaxy. Um, that's actually an extremely poorly studied problem. Um, as many, as, as is the case in many things in cosmology, that, that redshift really shifts a lot of spectroscopic transitions into the optical band that you can study better at redshift two than you can study at redshift one or, or zero. Um, dark matter obviously is something that we have in our galaxy. And so you might imagine that testing variations in constants against, against the, the other things that we have no ideas about in the universe, like dark matter and dark energy, can be done um, by, by, by looking across our galaxy. And that's something that I'll talk about today. So I'll talk about two things today, the two main approaches that I've followed to, these, to addressing these questions, and that is the quasar spectroscopy that you just heard about, and also the stars, which, which are, are, the, are the, new, the new thing here. Um, I'll give you the answers straight away. Um, the, the, the takeaway point from from this talk is that for quasars, um, which I'll use by way of introducing all the methods and background knowledge you need to understand the stellar work, um, we don't think that the quasar absorption spectroscopy gives any evidence for variations in constants. <clears throat> One of the things that's most important there is to understand why that's the current status and what we're doing about it. So I'll talk about that briefly. And then for stars, you know, this is a work in progress. Um, and I'll, I'll demonstrate to you that this, this technique really does work um, and why, why it's only now that we're doing this, uh, but also I'll, I'll show you some of the result, results that really demonstrate that. So let me talk about one constant in particular, uh, the fine structure constant. This is uh, the coupling constant, the, the, the strength of electromagnetism. Um, it's really the central parameter in a, um, a, a relativistic, see, uh, quantum mechanical um, electrodynamic theory. So quantum electrodynamics is really, um, you know, this, this number pops up in that theory. Um, and so it is, it's like the G uh, for gravity. You know, in this, this is the G for electromagnetism. It's really a very important number. We need to know it to do any reasonable experiments and, and know what is going to happen from them. <coughs> so why is this thing so important? Why are any of the fundamental constants so important? 
um, the first thing to understand is, well, why do we think that, why do we call them fundamental? Um, the real answer to that is because we actually don't understand much about them at all. Um, the theory, our standard model of particle physics, doesn't tell us anything about these constants. It doesn't tell us their values. It doesn't tell us what they depend on. It doesn't tell, tell us whether they vary. In fact, it doesn't tell us anything about the origin of these numbers at all. It just assumes that they're constant and you have to go into the laboratory to find out what they are. Um, that's pretty unsatisfactory for most theoretical physicists, at least. Um, why do we think they're constant? Well, um, we observe them to be that way. Um, they pop up in our theories, we go and measure them because they're so important, and we find that they are indeed constant, in, at least in our lab. And the, the lab experiments here are really some of the most impressive experiments I think you can do in a, in a, in a lab setting, um, really. Um, th these sorts of measurements where people have found that alpha is stable to within 10 to minus 17 per year, um, they're absolutely astounding in precision. Um, th this, uh, this has got to do with um, comparing different atomic clocks that, that tick according to different atoms, that atomic clock, clock, clocks built on different atoms, if you like. And, and you'll see why um, that's possible to do this when I start talking about the, the many multiple method later on in the context of quasar absorption lines. But this situation of, of not really knowing anything about these constants and, and merely observing them to be constant is not really satisfying in a theoretical sense. And, and Feynman kind of summarized this a long time ago. And even then it had been a, a, a long-standing problem where basically he was saying that um, this is really a mystery. Um, we don't know anything about these constants. They just, they're just there um, and really, in terms of theory, that's a really central problem. Um, and so you should put it up on your wall and, and worry about it. Um, really the main, the main point here is that this indicates that there's an incompleteness in the standard model. Um, it's one of the things that motivates theoretical physicists to try to look beyond the standard model and think, well, there must be a more fundamental theory or set of theories. Uh, hopefully one that kind of unifies all the um, physics that we currently understand and explains unobserved or un unknown phenomena um, like the values of the constants. <clears throat> Some people are a little, um, <clears throat> let me say, less impressed with that more general motivation. I, I find that very compelling. Um, Some people want to know, well, don't, don't you have a theory that tells us exactly how these constants vary? Well, the, the problem is, of course, no, those, those theories necessarily go beyond the standard model. So if people have um, modern unified theories, things like string and M theory, um, these often have uh, extra dimensions of space in, um, in them, and these are sort of compactified. But if you want to calculate a quantity in our three plus one dimensional subspace of those theories, you usually need to sort of integrate over those extra dimensions, sort of like a, a, a Gauss's, Gauss's law type integral. And naturally then you end up expressing anything in our three plus one dimensional subspace of that theory like alpha, it becomes a, a function of the sizes of those extra dimensions. So in, in general, unified theories um, allow for or indeed require variations in constants. Um, if you want to stop that from happening, you have to stop those, those extra dimensions varying in size. And that's an unnatural thing to do. It's our, our, our dimensions, our three dimensions of space expand, they, they change with time, and our one dimension of time changes with time. So it's, uh, you know, it, we expect those extra dimensions to do the same. There are, you know, you may be aware that um, dealing with unified theories and string theories in particular um, is quite difficult. There's not, they're not very predictive. Um, so one thing that people do when they're trying to explore some of the sort of implications of such theories is they take inspiration, if you like, from the string theories and they, they build much simpler theories like, uh, like scalar field theories here. Um, there's a very simple one from Bekenstein in 1982, where, for example, you know, that's a varying E theory. It, it takes a scalar field and assumes that it, couple, it, it, that it couples to electromagnetism. And so any, <clears throat> anything that drives that coupling drives a, a, a variation in E. So you can see that um, in, in 2004, these authors here put this same Bekenstein theory into a cosmological context and looked as a function of redshift and the main components of the universe here, lambda, matter and, and photons, um, and you look, they found that, you know, this should drive variations in the fine structure constant here in some weird units. Um, so this, this variation is then damped out at, at late times by um, the, the stronger presence of lambda. 
But that's just one theory. You can make lots of these different theories. Some of them are called varying C theories. For, for every Z varying C theory, there's a varying E theory. They're just different sides of the same coin. But varying C, you can think of more intuitively as explaining things like the cosmological horizon problem and other cosmological problems. They're attractive for various reasons, um, but you know, they, they obviously are simple scalar field theories that help you explore what, what might happen um, in, a, in a more fundamental unified theory like, like string theory. Um, I would say though that scalar fields have sort of gained a little bit of importance. People sort of used to think of them as almost toy models. Um, but we do know of now one Higgs, uh, one, one scalar field, that's the Higgs field. Um, so that, that is interesting that we've now discovered a, a scalar field. I think one of the more important discoveries um, is you know, a fundamental scalar field. And I should just point out for the rest of this talk that I, I will be talking just about alpha here, but that there are other constants, of course, lots of other fundamental constants like the proton to electron mass ratio. You know, that one can also be accessed via spectroscopy of molecules. Um, but all of these constants should be linked together in, in a grand unified theory. If one varies, the others vary. And so it's found in these, a lot of these scalar field theories that um, the proton to electron mass ratio actually varies more than, than alpha does. Um, nevertheless, I'll, I'll concentrate on alpha in this talk. So how do you access alpha? How do you measure alpha from spectroscopy? Uh, spectroscopy is an amazing tool in, in astronomy. So if we can access alpha via spectroscopy, then we can, we can actually measure it in the distant universe and nearby with stars, as I'll talk about later. Um, this is a simple energy level diagram of a, a very common transition in quasar absorption lines, at least. You can, you can see these two transitions at slightly different wavelengths. They're only there as different transitions because the, the upper level, the P level of this silicon-4 um, iron is split by the spin orbit coupling. This is called the fine structure splitting. And it's exactly where the fine structure constant gets its name. So you know that these upper levels then, this splitting that you see depends on alpha. In fact, what you're seeing is the relativistic effects um, come into the, uh, the, the spectroscopy of this atom. And so really it's the relativistic corrections where alpha is important for us. Um, and if I ask you, you know, where, the, um, where the, the strongest relativistic corrections are in this system, um, can anyone tell me just quickly by switching on your microphone? Okay, I get silence. <laughs> it's probably people struggling to um, work microphones, but, but actually the, the lower ground state here, the S state, is the one that has the largest relativistic corrections. But by comparing these two transitions to different upper levels, you completely negate any um, strong relativistic corrections in the lower state. You're not, you're not sensitive to it by looking at these transitions. Um, that, lower, that lower ground state has um, the largest relativistic corrections because the S wave state, if you recall, spherical state has um, you know, the highest probability for the electron is very, very close to, or in fact, inside the nucleus. That's where the relativistic corrections are highest. If you, if you like, the, the, the electron is moving fastest there. Whereas in these, these P-shaped, dumbbell-shaped um, uh, orbitals, the, the electron's very far away from the, the nucleus, so you get very, very little relativistic correction. So this is a very simple um, sort of alkali doublet comparison. You can tell that you'd be able to measure alpha in this way, but not very sensitively. So um, that's, that's just what I've just said. The, the, a better method is called the many multiplet method. And this is the, the heart of basically any modern spectroscopic measurement of alpha. Um, this allows you to access those um, larger relativistic corrections by comparing one ion with another ion, or indeed different multiplets within the same ion um, against each other. <clears throat> and this allows you to access those extra, that extra sensitivity to alpha. So if you write down a sort of an intuitive, um, if you like, expression for the, the relativistic corrections in atoms or the, the sensitivity of their wavelengths, of the transition wavelengths to alpha, you get something like this. This is not really the full picture, but it, it's illustrative. You see there's a strong um, Z dependency, the atomic number. So by comparing uh, light and heavy ions, you should be very sensitive to alpha. There's a squared um, dependence there on Z. But there's also this um, funny angular momentum, angular momentum term. Obviously, the sensitivity to alpha depends on the angular momentum, the type of orbitals, as we've just seen. Um, and this, this constant 
being about 0.6 means that as you increase j, you flip the sign of this whole term in square brackets. And so you suddenly have transitions, even from the same iron, that have different signs, so that the, the wavelengths um, get longer or shorter, depending on how alpha changes, and they'll, they'll do the opposite to each other. So generally speaking, what we're looking for in, in our quasar spectroscopy and stellar spectroscopy is you see a velocity shift of a line relative to another line. Um, and this depends on their Q coefficients, their sensitivities to alpha, if you like, it's just their relativistic corrections. So you have to calculate these Qs from quantum mechanical calculations, that's not easy. And you have to measure the velocity um, shifts to, to measure our delta alpha and alpha, a relative change in the fine structure constant. So that's how we do these measurements spectroscopically. And now I'll talk for a little bit about quasar absorption lines and give you kind of a status update, if you like, of where this field sits. I think it's a bit confusing at the moment if you look at the literature. Um, so I'll, by way of introducing this many multiple further and it's the, the, the stellar work really sits on top of that, um, it's good to actually just look over the quasar absorption results. So with quasars, as I'm sure George has, has told you many times, you look back along the line of sight from Earth to a background quasar. And most of the time you just intervene these um, very diffuse clouds in the intergalactic medium and you get absorption in the Lyman alpha forest here in the Lyman alpha transition, just bluewards at lower redshifts than the Lyman alpha emission line of the, of, the, of the quasar itself. But sometimes your line of sight moves through a, a high redshift um, galaxy or the outskirts of that galaxy and you get a lot more hydrogen and it gives you a much stronger damped um, absorption signal there for the hydrogen. <clears throat> that also has some trace metals in it, that cloud, and you're actually able to see with these higher column densities, these metal lines appear. And you can see them very easily in the red part of the spectrum where you don't have this confusing Lyman alpha forest of absorption. And so you can see there's a very distinct pattern, almost like a barcode, of the sharp absorption lines from these metals in this distant um, galaxy. And indeed that, that barcode, that set of relative separations between these lines, is the imprint of alpha. Uh, alpha controls that set of relative separations, just like in a barcode, alpha is encoded in that barcode. So here is that barcode again uh, on the top line. Um, here you see just the, the transitions just represented as sticks uh, from all these different ions that we typically observe in quasar absorbers. And on the vertical axis, you've got delta alpha and alpha, the relative change in alpha. And you can sweep alpha, delta alpha and alpha from being zero down to minus one that, that produces the fully non-relativistic limit uh, of electromagnetism. And you can calculate how these lines will shift. So the iron lines, for example, shift by a large amount as you change alpha, whereas the neighboring um, light atom magnesium, um, its transitions here, these three here, don't shift much at all. Um, so by comparing iron and magnesium, heavy versus light ions, you get a very sensitive system to alpha variation. Similarly here with zinc and chromium, they have lines that are interspersed with each other here and they shift in opposite directions. The zinc is uh, positive, the chromium is negative. So they have different um, orbital structures that allow that. And there's some other transitions down here in the very blue that we tend to observe at higher redshifts um, that have less sensitivity to alpha, but still a variety of different sensitivities. So that's the heart of the many multiple method and why we're able to measure delta alpha and alpha directly from these spectra. Um, to give you an idea of scale, I'll talk a lot about uh, parts per million and even parts per billion in delta alpha and alpha. Um, typically in these sorts of systems, especially for these iron lines versus magnesium lines, a relative shift in velocity between these lines of about 20 meters per second um, is what corresponds to a, a one part per million change in alpha. <clears throat> so, you know, think about 20 meters per second, that sounds pretty small for most people who do spectroscopy, but of course, um, Optical spectroscopy that can be done very precisely, like planet hunting, um, can achieve precisions, uh, albeit not very comparable to quasar ones, of about you know one meter per second in a routine way. So it's not an unachievable precision level, and it's indeed where we get down to in the quasar absorption analysis, which is pretty amazing. So the story started a long time ago, um, at the towards the end of my PhD, where we measured um, delta alpha and alpha here in units of ten to minus five on the vertical axis. Um, in 143 absorption systems. And they're just plotted here against their redshifts. Um, and the upper panel just shows the, the measurements and their one sigma errors. But the lower panel 
shows you the, the bin values. So you just take the weighted mean of those values in 10 bins. And you notice that the overall trend is that these values tend to lie below zero. Um, there's a evidence here for a smaller alpha in these absorption clouds. Now, I don't think anyone, including us, really believed these results at the time. It's one spectrograph. It's one archival data set that we didn't have much control over. At, at that time, there weren't real, real archives. Your archive was um, your colleagues and friends who donated spectra to you that they worked hard on producing. And often, the, um, you know, how much they gave you in terms of uh, data reduction products was pretty limited. Um, so we didn't have a lot of control, if you like, over the, um, the quality of these results. Nevertheless, they seem to stand up against many tests of against systematic errors. You'd like to do this again, obviously on a different telescope and spectrograph. So over the next sort of uh, um, eight or nine years, we did that with the VLT UVES archive. So again, not spectra that were taken specifically for this, but were taken for other purposes. Um, and again, 153 absorption systems, but looking at the bin plot down the bottom, you see we don't see the same results. We don't see a uniformly smaller alpha in these absorption clouds. We see, well, not much difference at low redshift between the lab value and, and the uh, quasar absorption value. And high redshift, some sort of bias to higher um, values of alpha. Um, not very convincing at all. And the first thought you have is, um, well, there's some systematics at work here that operate differently on these different telescopes. Um, that's probably the explanation. Um, we always agreed with that position and that was, it's always been our default position. Um, but there's a surprising sort of consistency when you realize that um, these two telescopes, Keck and BLT, um, see different parts of the sky. And so your temptation is to plot these results across the sky. I'm not going to fully explain this plot, but basically plot the results across the sky and you see that um, uh, you know, you, any, any distribution on the sky like this of values of delta alpha and alpha, where the size of the point is the significance and the, the color of the point gives you the sign, um, you can fit a dipole to anything that you put up on, on a map like that. And if you do that, you get this red blob in the, in the this is the dipole direction um, that you fit to those data. <clears throat> However, if you fit it to the different telescopes individually, um, you get the green and blue blobs. Um, so surprisingly, they are actually consistent with each other. They give the same dipole direction and dipole amplitude, etc., which is pretty surprising if this is wrong. Um, you can also find, it turns out, the, the same agreement if you break this sample up in terms of redshift, just two redshift bins, high and low. Um, so that's pretty surprising. If, if this is all wrong, then it's a pretty nasty set of systematics and a pretty big conclusion, uh, sorry, coincidence that it's giving rise to here. Nevertheless, that's probably the most likely, <coughs> the most likely explanation. However, there was some, you know, pretty interesting work that gave us um, a little more confidence back in 2008, where you can say, okay, um, your result here depends on you being able to calibrate well in your quasar spectrum, the separation between different absorption lines in, in velocity space or wavelength space. Um, let's go and take a spectrum of the sun uh, via an asteroid, which is a nice point-like object. It just reflects sunlight. So you get a, su a sunlight, you get the sun's spectrum back from a point-like object, a point-like object like a quasar. So you're taking, doing spectroscopy of a quasar-like thing where it itself, its own spectrum, can be compared to a reference spectrum, a, a laboratory spectrum of the sun. And so you can check the calibration very, very precisely. Um, you can check the calibration that you uh, undertake normally at the telescope and apply to your quasar analyses by doing this sort of super calibration using an asteroid or, as I'll show you in a moment, solar twin spectrum. And what Malaro et al found in 2008 was that actually things are fine. Um, the the um, super calibration gives null results. It shows you that the calibration that you normally do for quasar spectroscopy is fine. So that gave us a lot of confidence. But we decided to extend that method using um, solar twins in new observations that we were doing um, in the, in the um, sort of 2012 onwards. And we realized that actually you could just observe um, stars that were very much like our sun because the, this, the, this, the um, spectral lines all fall in the same place. And so you know, you don't really need a spectrum of the sun from an asteroid. Asteroids are a pain because they move on the sky. You can just find some solar twins that are nearby your objects of interest and, and take exposures of those during the night as well as a super calibration. Well, we did that, but actually what we find was that in almost all cases, um, we don't get 
um, a null supercalibration. So what you're seeing on this plot here is um, the, how, if, if you like on the vertical axis, how wrong the calibration that we normally do with a quasar is at these different telescopes. And I'm just showing you one example spectrum from each telescope. These results do vary from exposure to exposure and over time, um, but nevertheless, they're pretty representative. So what you see here is that for the UVERS spectrograph, um, it has two arms, the, the blue and the, and the red. Um, you see that the, the calibration drifts by a, a large amount, sort of 500 meters per second over about a thousand angstrom range. And it's a similar thing in the red arm as well. For Keck, it's in this case, in this example, it's the opposite. It um, drifts in the opposite direction. So what it means is that if you would compare a transition that you detect over here at 5,500 angstroms with one you detect at uh, 4,000 angstroms, you'll infer a spurious velocity shift between those transitions. And that's exactly what you don't want when you're trying to measure alpha. And so these slip-based spectrographs probably have some sort of light path difference between their calibrator spectrum, usually a thorium argon lamp, and their object spectrum. Um, this is something we suspected all the way from the start. If you look at our early papers, this is the one danger we, we talk about. Um, but it's only really recently that we've been able to demonstrate this very, very precisely now with this super calibration techniques. And so we know by mapping out in, in, a, in a sort of a sparse history throughout the uh, history of these uh, slip-based spectrographs, we know that this uh, effect was there, that it varied somewhat, but was different a little bit in these different um, spectrographs. And so actually, if you model the effect of that on your quasar results, you find that it can pretty well simulate, you know, it's pretty, pretty well mimic uh, the non-zero delta alpha and alpha results that we found from those quasar results. So it was pretty uh, disappointing, but also good that we could finally decide, okay, this is probably a systematic error. I should say though, we don't fully understand where the systematic error comes from, why this is arising in these spectrographs. Um, even the instrument scientists are a bit baffled in this case. And uh, it really must come from some sort of light path difference, but we're really not sure how that arises. So if you now, instead of using the uh, um, solar twin and, and asteroid spectra as um, sort of checks on your calibration, you actually use them to correct your calibration and you do new, new dedicated observations with high signal to noise ratio of um, a, a small sample of quasar spectrum, uh, quasar absorbers now, 28 absorption systems. We've made 52 measurements now of these you get the results that you see in front of you where I bin them up according to um, their object and sometimes telescope. Um, some of these points are less reliable than others, but basically the overall story is that um, you don't see any evidence for variation in alpha at the one part per million level. So that's pretty impressive precision here. And you can see that the, we've been able to get the systematics down to roughly half a part per million. Um, and what I'm plotting here is also the, the value of alpha as a function of the dipole direction on the sky. So this is how far away from that fitted dipole um, that you saw before. So what you'd expect is to see results lining up on this gray band or scattering around it a little bit, but we don't see that. And actually there's sort of three and a half sigma evidence against the dipole, um, at least in that direction on the sky from these results. So the overall status at the moment uh, from the quasar work is that um, there are no variations, at least as a function of redshift, or time at the sort of two part per million level with high confidence. Um, there's no variations in an alpha across the sky uh, or in sort of a, some sort of cosmological spatial sense. Um, and we've kind of reached the precision um, that we can get down to for an eight to 10 meter class telescope. But what we haven't exhausted is the reliability. Um, so basically you don't want to have to be correcting your wavelength calibration um, with um, observations of stars, if you can help it. What you'd really like to be able to do is do a proper calibration on a very well calibrated stable spectrograph. Um, that's what the HARPS spectrograph is. If I just go back to this diagram here, you'll see that um, the black line is coming from the HARPS spectrograph, which is a vacuum sealed spectrograph with a fiber feed. So it avoids a lot of the possible problems that um, slip based open air spectrographs have, um, like the Keck and BLT. Um, basically, uh, Espresso now at the VLT is a super harps that we've been working on for 15 years. It's now working and we're going to be releasing um, a blind analysis of results, uh, measurements of delta alpha and alpha from that uh, spectrograph in the, in the coming year. 
And um, I can't tell you the results because they're blinded. <laughs> I don't actually even know what they are. I know that they're just as precise as the previous measurements from the VLT. It's the same telescope, of course. We have the same light gathering power, but a much better spectrograph. And that's the idea is to make these, res these results uh, much more reliable um, there and not just precise. So that's a summary there of the, of the Quasar work. And that sort of lays some of the foundation for um, the, the stellar work that I'll describe in a moment. I, I talked about um, looking for variations in alpha as being a problem of, um, you know, people have looked in the laboratory, we've now looked with quasars over long cosmological time periods and, and large spatial scales. But there's no reason why alpha should vary according to space or time. Um, why not other things? Uh, for example, gravitational potential, for example. After all, we don't know the links in a, in a deep sense between gravity and the standard model sector. Um, similarly, we don't know any links between the other stuff we don't know about in the universe, dark matter and dark energy. So people are asking these questions as well. It's actually surprising that you can use white dwarfs, for example, to probe this um, gravitational dependence of alpha, -alpha um, down to you know, 25 parts per million level. Um, using very, very similar techniques to what I just described. Um, these techniques have a, some real problems at the moment, but they are improving. There are some also sort of indirect and model dependent sort of um, uh, results that you can get from laboratory constraints and cosmology um, on the dependence of, of alpha on dark matter or, or, or any relationship between those two things. Um, but we wanted to make a much more direct um, measurement using our spectroscopic techniques. Um, to really test for any um, relationship between alpha and dark matter. So here I've just drawn um, the Navarro Frank and White profile for the dark matter density in our, in our galaxy. Um, this is constrained um, in, in its scale from observations. So we, we don't know for sure that our dark matter in our galaxy follows this profile, but it, it seems to, to a reasonable um, approximation. And you can see here at the, at the sun, we have a dark matter density ratio of one. And as we go towards the middle of our galaxy, the, the dark matter density shoots up, especially as you start to get closer to our, to our galaxy uh, center. So, you know, if you can go sort of four kiloparsecs away, you've already got a, a dark matter density contrast of, of a factor of three. So that's, that's quite a large um, contrast already. Um, so there's a temptation now to go out and measure alpha across our galaxy. Um, to see whether it changes with um, increasing dark matter density. Um, the only problem is you need a probe to do that. You need to find something that allows you to measure it. There's a good um, recent motivation I saw come out of this, and it's another one of these string inspired motivations, these more specific ones that I mentioned before, where people looked at exactly this. I don't think they even know that we're doing this project. So um, they'll be surprised to learn we're doing it, but they've looked at the a scalar field theory where they couple um, where, where there's a connection between dark matter and, and alpha. And indeed they look at, in their model, a variation from between about, you know, eight kiloparsecs out from the, the middle of the galaxy inwards um, to about, you know, a few kiloparsecs, you'd get a, a variation in alpha at the level of maybe sort of one part in 10 to the eight or something like that. Um, depending on your dark matter model and obviously um, they've put some, some numerical values on this vertical axis, but really this is a, a tunable scale here within their model. It's, there's no specific reason why it should be um, these particular numbers. Um, so, but at least there's a, a, a theoretical, simple theoretical basis to expect a, a, a variation in alpha as a function of distance in our galaxy um, if you have a connection between dark matter and, and alpha. So how can we do this? Um, I've, I've already shown you the, you know, I've already told you the answer, we want to use solar twins, but why? Um, and why hasn't anyone done this before? After all, if you look at a quasar spectrum, uh, here, here is a, the, the quasar spectrum that produces the best delta alpha and alpha measurement. Um, and you can see that it basically has sort of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines that contribute to um, a constraint on variation in alpha. Whereas in the same wavelength range in a, in a stellar spectrum, a solar twin spectrum, you have hundreds, if not thousands of lines. So why don't we use stars then? Um, if you can zoom in and see, you know, there's on a very, very small um, wavelength range, you see a large number of lines, nice and sharply defined, that you could in principle use. The reason no one's done this, and actually people have done this recently with a, a measurement um, near the center of our galaxy actually, um, but it's subject to the following problem. The reason that we haven't done this 
before is because, um, you know, as I've said, that a changing alpha relies on shifting transition wavelengths. And so um, the problem with stellar lines is that they're strongly asymmetric. Um, you can see here a, a, a simulation of a line in 3D. Um, you can see that it differs very, very markedly from its 1D um, cousin. Basically, it's, it's, it's not symmetric and it's shifted from where it should be um, at, um, according to its laboratory wavelength. So if you try to compare um, the laboratory wavelength to your measured wavelengths of lines in stars, you will get very strong systematics of the order of several hundred meters per second. Um, so here is a classic plot from Dravens of the, the, this is the position of the line bisector, basically the centroid of an absorption line, multiple different absorption lines, in fact, um, as a function of their depth, right? So this is how the, the centroid position of a line changes according to its depth, which of course has something to do with where, where in the photosphere in the star the line um, main optical depth rises. So you can see that basically stars are, as you'd expect, not very good for measuring alpha. They're bubbling, broiling, uh, magnetized, swirling, rotating, magnet, um, you know, um, solar spot containing balls of mess. And they're really not the sort of thing you'd like to probe fundamental physics. But we think we have figured out how to use them much better than this. Um, and that is by using solar twins. And the, the idea here is that you compare on this diagram, let's say you look at the two transitions, very similar transitions, very similar depth in these transitions um, in one star. And you go to the same transitions in another star here, star B. But the crucial thing is that star should be almost identical to star A. So it's physics, it's mass, it's um, temperature, metallicity, um, surface gravity, all those things that determine the photospheric, photospheric makeup and the line formation process should all, all be very similar between these two stars. And if you look at the same pair of lines in these two stars, they should have the same systematics, the same asymmetries, the same um, problems as each other. And so you can use, if you like, star A as a reference for star B. Actually, you don't need to call one of them a reference. You can just compare them. But think about it in those simple terms. Um, star A is a reference now where you don't need the laboratory anymore and you don't need to know the laboratory wavelengths of all these transitions. You just use one star versus another. And so this is a really highly differential approach <clears throat> that we think should allow you to suppress almost all of the systematics that I talked about before. So the key points are that the asymmetry effects that I mentioned before are going to be very sim similar in the same pair of transitions from star to star if those stars are very similar to each other. Um, an advantage is that because you're studying the same pair of transitions at the same redshift, that is zero, a modulo or radial velocity difference between the two stars, they fall in the same part of the detector, the, your instrument. And so instrumental systematics that we, of the sort we saw before for alpha in, in, in quasar absorbers are really strongly suppressed. Um, you'll get the same sort of variety of alpha sensitivities, these Q coefficients that I mentioned for quasar spectroscopy, you'll get the same um, sort of variations between transitions. Um, and if you can look at a large number of transitions, you'll get um, therefore a lot of um, not just sensitivity to alpha, but opportunities to test for systematic errors and, and, and remove them. So we've, we've pushed ahead with this, um, with this approach and used at the moment only very close lying pairs, pairs that lie very close to each other with very similar depths. And so that limits the sort of asymmetry difference to start with as well, that further suppresses the systematic effects. And we've also just avoided even you know, extremely weak um, telluric features that normally in quasar spectroscopy, we don't worry about at all. The, the, the great thing about all of this is that we've been able to access, again, archival data, but this time, you know, 10,000, more than 10,000 exposures of sun-like stars um, in this HARPS archive, this HARPS spectrograph, this vacuum sealed, fiber fed, very well calibrated spectrograph that's normally used for finding um, uh, extrasolar planets, uh, routinely down at the one meter per second sort of reflex motion um, scale. And these, the, all these exposures have very high signal to noise ratios, really that are almost un unheard of for quasar spectroscopy. So we can make very precise measurements and really explore and make sure that the systematics um, are not there 
um, when we use this technique. Um, there's a really good opportunity there in terms of systematics for, you know, you have a large number of time series on single stars because people have looked for planets. So they've gone back to the same um, target hundreds of times. And this allows us to really check for systematics and solar cycles and magnetic spots and all these sorts of interesting, but for us ultimately uh, annoying uh, systematics. But knowing that we can remove those is, is, is really important. So the, the, the cool thing about all of this, and I won't go into much more about the method, is that it works. And I just wanted to show you some results that we, we got recently um, where we've been able to sort of almost do our best sort of analysis on some um, set of solar twins uh, in the nearby universe. These are all um, within 50 parsecs of the sun. And that is true of actually all of the solar twins that we know about. Uh, the most distant solar twin we know about is about um, sort of 400 parsecs away. Um, so really these are all nearby stars. They're being studied at very high signal to noise. Um, and, and again, 200 per pixel. Um, but these nearby twins compared to the sun, and this is actually an analysis of a, an asteroid spectrum, uh, reflected sunlight. So this is actually a measured zero here. This, this dashed line represents the mean um, velocity separation between two transitions. Um, and, and this is the same pair of transitions, a single pair of transitions in all of these different stars. And it shows you that that measured separation is the same uh, from, from star to star to star. From these very similar stars, we see the same velocity separation. So no longer talking about 200, 300 meter per second offsets and asymmetries, we've got those systematics down to a, 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 a photon statistical limit at the moment of 10 meters per second precision for each of these. Um, and if you had 25 of these pairs, for example, which we do, um, even if you just choose the best pairs of lines at the moment, you can already get down to a precision in alpha of about 100 parts per billion, that is 0.1 parts per million. So we're already doing um, an order of magnitude better than the quasar spectroscopy case that took 20 years to do, um, just from the existing data that we already have on, on 10 stars. Um, and we're going to be expanding this analysis a little bit um, focusing on the best stars, the best pairs of transitions for the first paper on this and then really um, you know, showing the, the full technique very soon. Um, so this is, yeah, as I say, the, the reliability of this is established from over 10,000 exposures on HARPS um, using not just solar twins actually going a bit further out in, in parameter space for these stars. And <clears throat> we seem to be detecting a sort of a, a systematic error floor of about a few meters per second for a single transition. Um, but then you can average over transitions um, to, to um, suppress that even further. And that does average out. So this technique really does work and it works to fantastically high precision. So we're really excited to be able to now explore um, not just the local universe, but the, the local galaxy, but um, the uh, much further away. So the first phase of this project is, is one of what I mentioned already, where we have a dark matter density ratio of zero, lots of stars in the local, un local part of the galaxy where the dark matter density is the same. And we, we get down to a precision of already 100 parts per billion. And we can probably push that a bit further with some um, simple statistics um, in this first phase of the project. We think that by using um, some other interesting techniques and further suppression of systematic errors, that we should be able to get down to about 10 parts per billion um, eventually, possibly even further if we take it to the statistical noise limit of two parts per billion, but that might be a bit of a stretch. So this is where we're heading for the first part and second part of this project. But the third part, as I've already intimated, is that we want to look for distant solar twins so that we can actually um, measure alpha as a function of position in our galaxy. We want to go out to these larger dark matter density ratios here. And that's the, the third phase that we're building up now. Um, the problem is that we don't know any distant solar twins. Uh, we only know ones that are very nearby. So we actually have to find them. And I was a bit appalled when I, when I happened upon this. Um, I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I just want to have see these distant probes, but actually have to go out and find them myself. How do we do that? Well, it, it turns out that actually a, a whole bunch of instruments, four different instruments and their results fall into line for us. And the basic idea is this. We can find uh, and pre-select with photometry uh, distant solar twins from, from Gaia and SkyMapper the results of which have been released uh, recently. 
We can then go and spectroscopically confirm those candidates using an instrument on the AAT that's been purpose built for typing stars um, called Hermes. And then we can go to the VLT and use the new espresso spectrograph that's just come online to actually get the high signal to noise, uh, high quality, well calibrated spectra of these of the best stars, best solar twins, up to four kiloparsecs away to measure the, the fine structure constant in. So the, the fact that all four of these instruments and data sets have now appeared um, actually enables this project. We wouldn't have been able to do this five years ago. Um, so it's really um, quite amazing. So the idea here is that this first stage <clears throat> is the photometric preselection. We just use the colors of these stars, but importantly, their distances um, allow us to actually say whether these are really solar twins, not just, not just um, stars with the same color, but are really likely to have the same sort of mass, the same absolute magnitude. And we can select, let's say, a thousand of those candidates in, in a sort of a small two degree patch on the sky nearer, you know, on a line of sight that sort of takes us nearer to the galactic center, not in the plane, but somewhat off the plane so that you avoid dust and confusion, and et cetera. Then you can go to this um, instrument that's been operating for a few years now on, on the AAT um, called Hermes, which is uh, actually a forearm spectrograph. You get little bits of the spectrum which are chosen so that because they're very sensitive to the stellar type, they have the transitions in those spectral regions that allow you to tell the difference between different types of stars, which is exactly what we need, right? We need to be able to spectroscopically confirm stars as solar twins. And so it's, you know, at a moderate resolution, you get four, almost 400 spectra simultaneously in this um, plug plate that's got an automatic positioner. And you, you can very quickly then observe about a thousand stars, even down to magnitudes of you know, V of 17 and a half that is typical for a four kiloparsec distant solar twin. So that's the key thing is you are now actually probing quite faint stars once you take the sun away, four kiloparsecs away. And of those thousand, the idea is to try and get uh, 50 of the best ones. You know, you take the 50 most sun-like stars and then you go and, and observe them on, on espresso at the VLT. Um, I wanted to just show you some results um, which, which demonstrate that we really can do these, um, uh, the typing of these stars with Hermes spectra, even at signal to noise ratios <clears throat> at, of only about 25 um, per pixel in the, in the red arm of, 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 uh, of, um, of Hermes. So this, uh, what we did is we, we, we actually um, took this very, very large, you know, 500,000 star sample that the Galar survey is building up um, and they make stacked spectra in bins of <clears throat> um, the main stellar parameters, temperature, um, metallicity, and, and log G, the surface gravity. But what that allows you to do is you can build up a model of how all the different lines in that part, those parts of the spectra vary with those parameters. And so you can just apply that very simple model to um, any new star you come across to determine whether it's, especially ones that have been um, uh, pre-screened as, as having colors that are like solar twins. And you get, um, a 20% success rate. So 20% of the stars you, you uh, of the stars you choose uh, photometrically really do have, uh, really really are solar twins. Within um, small deviations in temperature here, um, in the black curve, and small deviations in metallicity. So you can say that these stars have um, temperatures within 150 Kelvin of the sun. They have metallicities within 0.15 decks of the sun, and and similar sort of surface gravity differences. And so that really, you know what sort of solar twins you're dealing with then, and you know that you can use those to measure alpha. So all we need to do is measure, um, you know, probably even 500 stars really at the AAT, and we would be able to find the 50 best ones as a function of distance away. So then we go to Espresso. Uh, this is the, the, the grating of Espresso here. This is, a, as I've described, is a, is a super harps. It's fiber fed, it's, it's in a vacuum chamber. It, it can be calibrated with a laser frequency comb. It's really stable. It's got a very high resolving power. Basically, it's the perfect machine for measuring uh, the fine structure constant in these stars and, and for quasars. Um, and so the idea will be to use a large program, maybe 150 hours on the VLT in future to, to measure the spectra of about 50 solar twins to measure alpha. Um, so that's the, the overall project. Um, we've demonstrated so far that the, the technique works and so now we're in the process of applying for time on these facilities. Um, just an interesting point if you haven't learned much about espresso yet it's actually sitting in a coude room um, not it's not attached to one of the 
uh, four VLTs. And so actually it can be fed from any of the four VLTs or indeed all of them at the same time. Um, so these modes have been used uh, regularly now at the, at the VLT. So it's very easily scheduled and therefore a bit easier to get time on than some of the other instruments at the VLT. It's just a sort of a handy tip for you to know. And also interesting just, um, just for the sake of it. So I'll conclude there um, to, to give you the one line status update about the Quasar work is that we have no evidence from that work for cosmological alpha variations. But at a pretty precise level, that's sort of one or two parts per million precision, which I think you know, no one starting out in that field really thought that we could get down to that level. Of course, we are systematics limited, I think, at this point, And that's where I think the espresso spectrograph will come in um, and really make a massive difference there to this field. Um, the solar twin work um, can be used to test uh, an alpha dark matter connection across our galaxy. Uh, the work with the, the local twins, the very nearby twins with HARPS, um, gives us an, if you like, easy, it's taken two years of work, but um, an easy uh, final precision of about 100 parts per billion in delta alpha and alpha. And we can push that probably uh, at least a factor of five further with some, some uh, another year of uh, painstaking work. Um, but the main game, I think, is to find these distant solar twins. We can do that now because of Gaia and SkyMapper. Uh, these photometric surveys. We can do it because of the Hermes instrument, um, you know, being basically built to, to, to type stars um, and a lot of them at the same time. And then using the VLT uh, Espresso, the new instrument that's really, again, purpose built for this sort of work to measure um, 50 data points across uh, four kiloparsecs in our galaxy and really test whether there's a connection between alpha and dark matter. And, and I think about the sort of 100 parts per billion level. Um, thanks. I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, any questions uh, on this, uh, this, this uh, talk about this? Uh, Tara has a question. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, so the first question is, um, you, so you talk primarily about solar twins specifically, and I understand the benefit of part of that is that we have one of the pair in our solar system and there's a lot of data available. Um, but in principle, could you do this with other spectral types of stars or are there other disadvantages to using other types of stars? Yeah, you absolutely could do this with other types of stars. So um, there's, there's the only reasons, I think you've sort of summarized them yourself for, for using the sun as a starting point is that we have um, so many spectra to make sure that this um, technique works. As soon as you go away from um, sort of F and G type stars, um, that might be tempting because you can look further in our galaxy like giants, um, but you have very few local examples and so you can't demonstrate that the technique even works. Um, the big advantage of starting where we did is that we have these 10,000 exposures of sun-like stars um, from HARPS and really they don't, you know, HARPS doesn't have a lot of stars outside that sort of sun-like range. Um, and so demonstrating that the, the technique really worked, after all it is new, <laughs> um, you need to establish belief in people <laughs> um, that, um, you know, establishing that for um, other types would be more difficult. But I, I think that there's a good chance that this technique will work. Um, if you start going to things like giants, the difficulty will be finding local examples where you can get very good spectra to really demonstrate that the systematics aren't swamping you at the larger distances. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is how uh, worried or is it a problem or is it helpful for a solar twin to be in a, a binary or a multi-star system or a planet like such that, for example, you can get mass better, but um, there may be other issues um, from just the, in terms of the precision of the RVs because um, you'll have some kind of Doppler effect inherent to the system. Yeah. So, so Doppler effects don't matter for us, which is good. Um, that's why we analyze, we have to analyze pairs of stars anyway for this technique. We have to, um, you know, take out that radial velocity as part of the analysis. So actually radial velocity changes in one star don't affect us. Um, of course, you know, occultations and, and, you know, activity and things like that in the stars might matter in a more complicated way. Um, so it might be that binaries are maybe not the best sort of systems to use. In terms of selecting solar twins, you, you point out that you might be able to get the mass 
Um, but these are generally much fainter type systems. We, we, we don't know whether they're binaries. We'll have to actually look spectroscopically for evidence that they're not binaries um, because that could complicate the analysis. You, the, other, the other companion star, if you like, might not be a solar twin and won't, won't have uh, a solar twin type star, uh, sorry, top solar twin type spectrum. So, you know, actually we're trying to avoid binaries in the, in, when we find distant ones. Um, for some of the closer um, examples, some of them do have very well determined masses. Um, these are the sort of hundred or so solar twins that we know of locally. Um, and, you know, some of them are so close that you don't need binaries to get the masses, but some of them are a bit further away and, and that's the technique that's been used. But it doesn't, it doesn't really help us too much because we, we need the spectrum to be the same. Not really, we're not so focused on just the mass being the same. If the mass is a bit different, then the temperature can be a bit higher and we'll get a very similar spectrum. So it's, it's really the, the combination of those things that um, matter for us. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, any, any other questions? I mean, I have one. Um, so how far out can you go actually with the, the current technique? How far into the galactic plane can you go? So, well, we're not in the galactic plane. We, we shoot off about sort of 20 degrees off the plane to avoid dust, but we can go in terms of distance um, about four kiloparsecs. So the, the limiting factor there is really, well, there's those, all, those four um, sort of instruments that I told you about in, in, a, in a sort of conspiracy have about the same limiting magnitude for us for, for this work. And Gaia, um, you can't get really a good parallax once for a solar type star, once you go beyond about four kiloparsecs. So if we need that to get to know that it's really a solar twin. We need its absolute magnitude. Um, we can't go fainter than about 17 and a half on Hermes for spectroscopic follow-up. And if you want to get a spectrum of an object on Espresso with an eight meter telescope now, um, but at resolving power of 140,000, your limiting magnitude is roughly 17 and a half as well. Um, so luckily all those things sort of agree, um, but that's kind of the limit for us for solar type stars. The previous question I asked about other stars, if you choose those, then you certainly can go further. Um, there was a recent um, application of not of, of the many multiple method, but not in this deferential sense, um, using giant stars near the galactic center. But unfortunately, I think, I mean, really it was just one star in the end that dominated that sample. And, I think that they're going to have some big problems with systematics there, as I, as I pointed out. Um, they won't be able to they won't be able to improve the precision there much at all. Okay. okay. So uh, you had this plot with. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in and ask a question, please, uh, I, I will defer to them. You had this plot with uh, some string in th string theory inspired theory, um, showing alpha varying with dark matter density. Yep. Where where would you, yeah, that one, where would you put, where are your data points on this plot? Yeah, so I, I was sort of trying to point to them at the time, but it's not as clear. I mean, they've looked at a, a large range of scales here in this logarithmic plot. So we're out here at eight kiloparsecs, right? Ah. Um, right. And depending on which dark matter model you choose, let's just choose Navarro, Frank and White. Um, you sort of start around here and then you observe, um, oops, something's happened here. I'm not sure what, my cursor disappeared you start here and you observe out to about here. <laughs> so, you know, on a long plot like this, I'm sorry, we, That's okay. <laughs> we drank. If you can go much closer to the, to, the, um, to the black hole, in this model at least, you don't gain all that much. You lose a lot of precision and a lot of systematics and orders of magnitude, but you don't gain much in terms of the variation in alpha. But that's just this model. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that this is really, as I say, some people sort of think of these uh, string inspired, these, these scalar field models as kind of toy models because you can invent whatever coupling you want um, pretty much. I mean, there's limits, but um, so I, I take this as sort of inspiration rather than necessarily a guide or even, a, or even something we can necessarily test because again, this, this vertical axis, it can be tuned as well. But wouldn't that say that you want to uh, double your uh, radius by also looking in the other direction away from the galactic center? Yeah, except there, it, it could mean that, and that, that is something we've considered. Um, the problem is there, the variations are actually sort of smaller, but yeah, you can see a big difference between where you are now and what you, you could regard the, the more distant objects, if you like, as the zero and your measurements locally as being the sort of the, 
the difference between the zero and, and here. So you, you're, you're expecting a small alpha, um, sorry, a larger alpha locally than where you look further away. Um, we could do that, but uh, the, the stellar density goes down and the metallicities drop and it actually starts to get very hard to select solar twin stars. Um, when you look the other way <laughs> um, in our galaxy, um, you can, when you're looking towards our galaxy, not in the galactic center in the plane, um, the, the metallicities drop as you go off the plane, but because you're looking towards the middle of the galaxy, the metallicities are increasing anyway. And so you can actually find this sort of a sweet spot of finding um, solar twins um, sort of towards the galactic center, if, if you like, or near, nearer the galactic center. Thanks. All right. Any more, any more questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, George has questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll do, um, sorry, Michael. So you, uh, you made a, a good point about the, um, you know, checking with the stars sort of pointed you towards system X and the quasar data. Yeah. Um, did it, or can you just say again, did that clear up the dipole, the, the dipole coincidence? Um, I wouldn't say it's 100% proof that it's wrong at the moment, but um, what I like to say is that the results from that sort of super calibration, um, this sort of establishing the sparse history of these distortions, these systematic errors through the history of those spectrographs, as we're able to do from the archives, um, that basically completely undermined my confidence in those previous quasar results. Um, I can't show for sure that they explain away the dipole or the individual results from the different telescopes. They do a very good job if you even just use a simple model. To me, that's extremely suggestive and I would say completely undermines my confidence. If you talk to John Webb, my, my former supervisor and the person with whom I worked on those results, um, he seems to take a very different view. And so I won't put words in his mouth, but um, he would say, no, no, it's actually strengthened the, the evidence. And I'm, I struggle to understand that myself, but to me, I don't have any confidence. I would say that most people in the field don't either. So uh, I, I think they're not explained, but uh, I think we can um, neglect them now. Which I don't like to say because I worked so long on them. <laughs> Any more questions? No, all right, well, thank you. Thank you again very much for coming to talk to us. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, no problem, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> See you later. Uh, we'll, we'll rejoin for the students now. I think maybe even oh. in the same Zoom, I'm not sure. Ah, uh, they're talking to you afterwards, okay. I'll, I'll go off and.